Praise the Lord. It's another beautiful Sunday. And uh, we are again blessed by the Lord to be here, to gather in His name so that we could learn, study, that we could give God the praise, the glory, and the honor that He truly deserves. And I'm also blessed by God again once more that I am able to share with you the things that I have learned, things that I have studied. And actually this message is with me for, for a long time already. It's in, it's in my, one of my study notes. I haven't had the time to share it with you. But today is a beautiful day and I'm able to share you this, this passage. The widow's mind. And this can be found in the book of Mark and at the same time in the book of Luke. And uh, anyone familiar with the story of this uh, widow? Okay. Let me read the passage. If you have your Bible, turn your Bible in the book of Luke, chapter 21, verse 1. Four. And this is what the scripture says. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury, and he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. For they out of their surplus put into the offering, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, again, our Lord God, we thank you as you gathered us in this place to learn from you. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us. Guide my lips, O Lord God, that I may speak the word of truth, that it may encourage us, enlighten us, Lord, we pray that you would speak into our hearts as we study this passage. The Lord God, we also pray that we would share this message, O oh God, to other brothers and sisters of ours, O oh Lord God. And uh, again, O oh Lord, we thank you. And the glory and the honor and the praise belongs to you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when we read this story, this is... This is when Jesus was in the temple and he saw these people, you know, uh, putting money into the treasure, right? They, they have a, like a box in there, they, they put the money in there. And, uh, and then this old woman, a widow, right? He put two small copper coins, uh, two mites. And what are two mites? Uh, I was checking the equivalent of these two coins, right? And the equivalent of that is one-eighth of a penny. Uh, we don't even use the penny here in Canada. But the amount of that money that he put in there, or she put in there, is one-eighth. An eighth of a penny. That's how much money this old woman have. And according to the scriptures, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. This is the only thing that she had and still have given it to the temple as an offering. And then probably after that, she could die. Right? Because nothing left. Right? And when we hear this one, and we hear it preach, we always hear that this is a good example of sacrificial giving. Meaning to say, you don't need to be rich to be generous. Right? Because this old woman, out of his poverty, and the only thing that she has to live on, still give to the treasury of God. So, 
most of the time, if not all the time, this is what we hear, right? But in order to understand this passage, we have to look back to the Old Testament on how the widows, the orphans, and the aliens are treated. How does the structure or the Jewish structure treats the orphans, the widows, and the aliens? Okay? You have to go back in there. Okay? And... Okay. Deuteronomy 14, 28 to 29, written by Moses, for the people of Israel, and this is it says, At the end of every third year, you shall bring out all the tithes of your produce in that year, and shall deposit it in your town. The Levites, because he has no portion, because the Levites doesn't have any property, right? There's no allotment for them in the Jewish land. Or inheritance among you, the alien, the orphans, and the widows who are in their town shall come and eat and be satisfied in order that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work that you, your hand, which you do. What it means here is that people are to collect every third year the tithes of the produce of that year. Okay? Well, if you look at this tithe, if you study the Old Testament, there are three types. Okay? Maybe you think no, 10%. Okay. There are three types. One is the sacred types or the Levitical types. Second is the festival types. And third is the this one. The type for the poor, which is only every third year. So now, if you do the math, do the math, it's going to be 23.33%. So well, that's the type. Okay? Ouch. 23.33. 10 is already difficult. 23.33. I'm going to die. But that's how it is. Okay? In the Old Testament, that's how it is. The tithe is not 10%. It's 23.33. That's just a sideline, okay? That's not the topic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, what's the purpose of this? Is to provide the needs of the orphans, of the aliens, of the widows, those who are destitute, those who are poor, those who are in need. Because it is a theocracy, a government run by God, and every government need funding. So the tithe that is being collected is actually used for the maintenance of the temple, for provision for the Levites, and at the same time to help the poor. Okay? That's the idea. Now, 24 verse 17 to 21, it says there, You shall not, shall not, pervert the justice, right? You must be just in everything you do with the alien, with the orphan, with the widow. What is the next one? It says that when you do harvesting in your field, either it is wheat or it is barley or whatever, it says there, and when you forget something, okay, you know when you when you harvest, you, you pile it into a ship, right? And sometimes when you gather, then you forget one or two at the back. God said, don't even go back and pick it up. And when you, you know, when you harvest it, the corners and the edges, leave it. Leave it for the poor. Right? Don't take it everything. Right? And then, it says there, and when you harvest your olives, you know, they normally shake the tree. Don't shake it until everything falls. Right? Leave some for the poor, for the needy, or for the destitute. Right? And then, the last part, grapes. You know, when you harvest the grapes, don't remove everything. Leave some for the poor. So, in the structure of the Jewish culture, there is always a provision for the poor, for the needy, and for the destitute. To those who could not help themselves, like the orphans, they're too young to work. 
the widows, their too old to work. The only sustenance that they would get is from the temple, from the structure, from the government that they have, right? Now, having that in mind, to understand the widow's might story, we have to go back a chapter before that, right? You read the chapter before that, right? Oops, I think it's coming, okay? They are all C anyway. And the first C here is from Luke 21 to 8, you would see the confrontation between Jesus and the religious leaders. They were confronting him and asking him, what authority do you have? Because he is preaching and he is teaching and in the verse before, in 19, he overthrew all the money changer. You know, he just, he just let all these animals loose and all this coin and these tables and he just overturned everything, right? So the people are asking him, or the religious leaders are asking him, what authority do you have to do all these things? In teaching and preaching, you're not even educated, you're not even schooled by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by this religious, so-called religious elite. You're not trained. What authority do you have? So Jesus said, you know, what authority does John have? John also does not have that, you know, education because he's in the wilderness. So he asked, what does John authority come from? They couldn't answer. So Jesus said, likewise, I'm not going to tell you what authority I have, right? So you see, there is a confrontation in there. And then Jesus mentioned about the master, the man who has a vineyard, and he asked somebody to take care of it. And then when the harvest comes, he's not taking everything. He's only taking the produce, a certain amount of produce. See, the man in this story is asking only a small portion of the harvest. He's not, you know, you could still handle, you could still enjoy, you could still use whatever, you know, you get from this vineyard. I'm just getting a portion of it. But what they did, they, they beat up the sling. The servant, three, second, third. And then the fourth one, he said, he said his son. He said, oh, they will respect him. What they did, they killed him. And when Jesus is telling this story, the religious leaders, they're upset because they knew, they knew that Jesus is referring to them. Right? This is the correlation. Next. Craftiness. What is craftiness? They tried to trick Jesus. No. They tried to ask Jesus, Jesus, is it lawful? Well, you know, it seems to be that they are very nice. It seems to be that they are, you know, really concerned. And they asked Jesus, is it lawful to pay tribute to Caesar? Right? Because they are under the Romans. They are supposed to pay taxes to the Romans. But you know, when Jesus say, let's say, when Jesus say, yes, pay taxes to the Romans, they would say, oh, he's a traitor. He, he's saying, you know, you have to pay tax for this foreign dominant power now that is, you know, treating us badly. He's not a good Jew. But if he says, no, don't pay to Caesar, Jesus will be in trouble with the Romans. So either he says yes or no, he will be in trouble. Right? That's why these religious leaders, they are so smart. They are very crafty. They think they could outsmart Jesus, but you know. The Lord answered, okay, give me, give me, give me this money. And whose face is that? I said, it's the face of Caesar, right? They gave to Caesar what is due to Caesar. Give to God what is due to God. Very smart answer. They could not accuse him of saying no or yes. You to Caesar, give it to Caesar. You to God, give it to God. So, they try again. Again. Now, when they talk about the resurrection, now Jesus asking about the resurrection, and these people are saying, 
Now, there are two groups, religious groups, in the Jewish culture. The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay? The Sadducees are the elite. They are the one on the top when it comes to the religious order. Uh, the high priests and all those high officials in the temple, they are coming from the Sadducees. But the Sadducees only believe in the Torah. They only believe on the five books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Leviticus. Only those five. The Pharisees, on the other hand, they believe even the prophets, right? So somehow, the Pharisees believe that there is a resurrection, but the Sadducees do not, right? So they were asking, you know, this, uh, Moses told us, you know, when somebody, somebody's uh, husband died, the brother would take over. Then they, you know, they make up this story of, you know, what if the other brother died and then married again, uh, died again, married again, and then they all died. It's going to be the husband in heaven. And Jesus said, oh, you're mistaken, right? Because in heaven, you don't marry, right? There's no marrying, marriage in heaven because there is no procreation in heaven, right? There are no babies, no born in heaven, right? And Jesus said, they're, they're like angels, right? So that is the conflict between the Pharisees and the Sadducees when it comes to the understanding of resurrection, right? So there are all things. Do you remember? Confrontation, correlation, conflict, craftiness, portion. Now what Jesus says here, Jesus says here that you have to be cautious when it comes to the scribes. Cautious with regards to the scribes. No, these scribes are another order. So there are Sadducees, there are Pharisees, there are scribes. Scribes are considered to be, how would I say, compared to us now as uh, lawyers, like, you know, notaries. You know, these are people at that time, they are the one who who do the legal documents, right? So, they are estate planners. They draw legal documents. So, when somebody died or somebody, you know, want to take care of the estate, they're the one who do the documentation, right? So, Jesus is warning the people. They're warning, you have to be aware with these people. Be cautious when dealing with these people, right? Here. It says there in Mark 12, it's also found in Luke, but I just put the one in Mark. In his teaching, he was saying, Before, oh, beware of the scribes who like to walk around long robes, like the special greeting in the marketplace, the chips sit in the synagogue, place of honor. They're always on the, you know, the most important seat, like, you know, there's a, they're on the front, not on the back. And then it says there in verse 14, who devour widows' houses, and for appearance sake, over long prayer, this will receive greater condemnation. Why do you say, who devour widows' houses? Why? Because they're scammers. They scam these old senile widows. They took advantage of these old people and took the money from them. Uh, even here in Canada, it, it, it happens. You know, most of the people who are victims of scam, mostly retired seniors. Right? That's, that's what they do. So Jesus is saying, you have to be beware of these people. You have to be cautious when dealing with these people. You know, because they abuse these old people. They're abusing them. Right? Now, when this woman put this coin on the offering, right, and Jesus said, this woman has given more than the rest of you, is it something that is prescribed? Does Jesus endorse 
or tell us that in everything that you have, sell your houses, sell your cars, sell your property, sell everything, give it to the temple. Is that, is that a prescription? Is it a principle that Jesus is trying to tell us to follow? Of course not. Because if you look at the previous topic that we have discussed, the institution, the temple, the Levites, and all those authorities are supposed to take care of these old destitute and poor people. Not to sip on and take advantage of them. This is what they are doing. So this old woman thinks that if he gives, or if she gives everything that she has, she would gain favor. Because that's the one they put in their mind. If you look at the previous chapter, verse 20, you would see that everything is wrong. Everything is wrong. The thing that they, how they run the temple, everything is wrong. Including this. This is wrong. So when Jesus says this one, it is not a prescription. It is a description. Jesus is only saying this is what it is. It's not saying you do the same. No. It is not a prescription. It is a description. Now, The temple area, the structure which God is established in the time of Moses, and all that structure and all that thing that is set in there, it is to be a place of benevolence. We need to say it is a place of goodwill. It is a place where when you go there, you would find help, you would find you know assistance, you would find goodwill. You know, that area is supposed to be a place where you could find somebody who will help you. A place of benevolence. What will happen? It became a place of malevolence. What is malevolence? Ill will, cheating, stealing, scamming. It became a place where instead of finding help, it is a place where people cheat each other, steal from one another, take advantage of the less fortunate. That's what happened. And Jesus was so angry. And Jesus said, you know, this is a place of prayer. My father's house it's a place of prayer. And you have turned it into a den of thieves. Instead of finding hope, instead of finding comfort, people take advantage of each other. Especially the less fortunate, the widows, the orphans, and the aliens. So now, do you think when Jesus came there, oh, good job, high priest, good job, Pharisees, good job, Sadducees, good job, scribes, do you think God would commend them? Do you think God would acknowledge that you are not doing a great job? Do you think God would approve, would endorse? This kind of action, this kind of thing that is happening? No. What did Jesus say? This is what Jesus said. It's not commendation, but condemnation. Condemnation. This is what he said. They were talking about this great temple, adorned with beautiful stones and motive, motive leaves. And Jesus is he said. As for these things which you look, a day will come where there will be nothing left. One stone over the other. 
everything will be thrown down. When this institution who's supposed to do is to help the poor and the destitute and the helpless becomes a place where they abuse and use these people, this place is going down. This place is going down. This is not what it meant to be. This is not a place where people are abused and used and maltreated. Now, what is this in connection with our now? Our generation. What is the connection? The church is supposed to be a place where we would gather, we have fellowship and help one another. Christian. No. It's supposed to be an institution to protect other people, to help the needy. But what people do nowadays, you know, they they try to seek on as much money from from the congregation. You know, they even twist the scripture, try to you know, manipulate or uh, somehow uh, compel people to be they're, they're, they're trying to make them feel bad you know if you feel bad you're stealing from God or if you don't do this you will not be blessed or do that so you feel bad oh, I don't want to feel bad like that why did I give but it's clear in the New Testament your giving should not be by compulsion right your giving should be willing Right? But people do that. And you see those people, they, they, they get a lot of money, you know what they do? They build beautiful buildings. Even in the early years, Europe, they build buildings, massive buildings, cathedrals, basilica. Now, what's the difference between, I didn't know what is the basilica and what is the cathedral. Cathedral is the seat of the Pope, or for Lord, or the bishop. There's a bishop, that is his place. Then you call that a cathedral, right? Big, huge cathedral. And if it's a, if it's a basilica, I think basilica is a place wherein a certain saint, a certain relic is, you know, put in there. So huge that building this massive, beautiful buildings need a lot of money. Simply that you wouldn't believe how much million or billion of money they they try to seek one from people. That's why Mother Luther got upset. You know, you're selling indulgence to, to build this building. Huge building. Right? How much money is used in building those buildings? Do you think they don't care about those buildings? And some people think that, you know, if I build this building, I'm building it for God. I think it, you know, has a heart for, you know, to build something for God, but God did not instruct him to build. Right? He did build, but God did not say, build me. The same way for us. He did not instruct us to use this money, a lot of this money, in order to build a building. He might as well use the money to help the poor. This morning, the, 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 compassion, the compassion group presented something in, in MFPC, you know, there are a lot of Christians in the Philippines who are poor, they have kids, you know, and they're only like around $47 per month to, you know, help these people, you know, support them in their study, give them enough food, uh, medicine. You know, if we have funds in the church and just sponsor one or two, three kids, it's better than a big building. And see what happened to those big buildings in Europe. <clears throat> Empty and dead. Because God never meant it. God never meant 
for us to build these huge buildings. I know it's comfortable to have your own building, to do your seminars and all that stuff, and don't get me wrong, that's okay, but that is not the priority. Our priority, we, we have the funds in here, then we would, you know, use it for paying the bills. But if we have extra, support the mission. Those missionaries, you know, they're, they're not luxuriously living. Their lives are in danger. Some of them are in places where, you know, they might be killed. Right? These kids, you know, would, parents could not support them in school. Might as well help them out. Invest in people, not on the building. What a waste. One million, two million, five million, ten million in a building. And they think God will say, good job. Good job. We have uh, made a good building. How about the poor? What did you do with the poor? And how about the flocks? What did you do? Did you feed them or please them? You try to make money out of the give more money so you'll be blessed. Come on. Right? Right? And sometimes people will say, no, if you don't collect money, how would the church survive? Right? Money is necessary. We need to support the church. Right? I'm not saying don't support. I am telling you, support the church. But your giving should be voluntary and willingly. Don't get, you know, somebody will say, you know, uh, hopefully nobody says that here. That if you don't invest, you will not get a return. You know, when you give, it's not an investment. Because if you think it's an investment, you are thinking of a return. Your salvation is already a blessing. So help the church to spread the good news. And some people say, hey, we don't collect money, we will we, 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 we be bankrupt. Come on. If God can provide for your needs, do you think God cannot provide for His own church? Do you have to resort into extorting people in order to give more? And then you just use it for, I don't know, and sometimes I, I, I just shake my head. Oh, we have a special offering today. Come on! There is no separate giving in the, in the old ways. They just give. Oh, this is only for the church. You cannot use this for benevolent. We, we have to have a separate giving for benevolent. We have to have a separate giving for the missionary. We have a separate... Come on! Give me a break. making a building, you know what's going to be on the top list? King Herod. King Herod is the one who built the second temple. He will be on the top. Good job, King Herod. He's not even a believer. But God never intended us to build these buildings. Nothing against them. It's good if we have them. But it is not the priority. And look at all those churches in Europe. They're all empty. They're all dead. The real church now are only living maybe in those areas where they are persecuted in Iran and China and Middle East, hiding, endangered, destitute, no money, no Bible. Here we have maybe two, three we don't even read. There you cannot even, you know, bring the Bible. I brought my Bible before in Saudi Arabia. The moment they saw it, they just throw it in the floor. It is just sad. 
It's just sad where the church is gone. Too many programs, too many strategy, too many... You know, if you want to grow the church, brothers and sisters, there's only one. Only one. You want to grow the church? It's the Word of God. When the Word of God is preached in a place, God would bring His children to hear that message. Now, if you preach what people want to hear, you will gather more people. The wrong people. Because they want what they can have for themselves. Not because they love God, but because they want to be wealthy, healthy, and happy. You know, when you become a Christian, forget about get, get, getting wealthy, healthy, and happy. Brace yourself. You, you, you will face persecution. You will be spit at, you will be ridiculed, you will be called crazy. I was called crazy one time. You know? You will be, you know, even your own family will. That's what Jesus said. Right? It's just so sad. That's why a lot of church nowadays, they're all going down. And the health of the church. It's not based on how many people are there. The health of the church is how many faithful people are there. Preaching the word. Equally, rightfully, dividing the word of truth. Not twisting it in order to make it look acceptable. It's just sad. When the institution who's supposed to help the destitute, the poor, and the needy becomes a place where people are abused, it's going down. And I hope that thing will not happen in this church. That's right. Father God in heaven again, O Lord. We thank you. For your great mercy and love, in spite of our shortcomings and our failures and our weaknesses and our imperfection, you have sustained us. You have kept us together. You have upheld us with your mighty right hand. And we pray, Father God, that you to continue to bind us in one love, in one accord, in one faith, and that we may live a life that is pleasing and honoring to you. And this we pray in Jesus' name.